So just a little bit uh, about David. Um, he's joined us here at Edge Hill as Professor of Education and Philosophy. And David studied classics as an undergraduate, but found his way into philosophy through literary studies. So he's very much at home in philosophy of education, in particular phenomenology and continental philosophical thought, but with a generalist interest in educational theory and methodology, and in the interaction between different disciplines that inform educational practice. But prior to that, David has led and taught religious education for over 10 years in secondary schools, including three years at Christ's Hospital in West Sussex, where he tells a funny story of how he was featured in the very first series of Rock School, and where students paraded into lunch every day accompanied by a full military marching band. So I can't imagine what that was like. Um, but after that, David has worked for over 12 years in higher education, initially at King's College London, and then at Oxford Brookes, and then just before joining us here at Brunel um, University in London. And he came and joined us at Edge Hill in 2020. Um, David is a co-editor of the prestigious British Educational Research Journal, and he's also assistant editor of the Journal of Philosophy of Education. And he, he's also, as if he hadn't got enough to do, He's also a co-editor of the Routledge Literature and Education book series. So I think that should give you a little bit of an insight. We're going to have a fascinating uh, whistle-stop tour of a whole range of um, subjects tonight. Um, but David is going to speak to us now on mind, brain and memory, on the interaction of folk psychology and educational science. So David, Professor Aldridge, welcome. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I, I really appreciate it. I admit to being a little bit surprised. It's lovely, so thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody who's here online as well. Uh, before I start to get out of the way, I've got to say particular thanks to my ever patient and enduring family, Claire and the, and the kids. I think I started my doctorate just before Eli was born, my oldest, and um, Scarlett had been born by the time it was finished. So you can get a sense of how long that took. All of their baby photos, therefore, are pictures of them cavorting in front of big piles of Heidegger texts or grabbing me in the face when I'm trying to get through my truth and method or wresting a copy of Bashka's um, realist theory of science out of my hands. So in reward for your, for your patience and endurance, you get to sit through this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you need to click to get, yeah. Okay, so I'll get down, I'll get down to it. I think uh, I mentioned cognitive sciences in the abstract, so I should clarify what I mean by the cognitive sciences, because cognitive science gets thrown around in educational context at the moment. So when, when, when I used to consider myself working in cognitive sciences, I'll say a bit more about that in a, in a minute, um, it, it described a cluster of related questions about knowledge, thought, consciousness, mind and body. Um, and you approach those questions through a variety of disciplines. There's, there's some of them, psychology, neurobiology, artificial intelligence, computer science and philosophy. So I, I, I consider philosophy to, a, to be a contributor to the cognitive sciences. Now, philosophers will make claims for what it is they do. One of the things they all claim to do is to come and sort of adjudicate conceptual um, disputes or to underlabor, clear up the concepts uh, for the other disciplines. Sometimes that is welcome, sometimes it's not. We don't care. Um, there's various disciplines within um, philosophy. So philosophy of mind epistemology are quite closely associated with cognitive science, but also my own work in, in phenomenology. Um, phenomenology has a history of informing the cognitive sciences. So, for example, in AI, Hubert Dreyfus's um, sort of um, explanation of the problems with the good old fashioned AI project comes from phenomenology and it's been pretty sticky and very few people now think that you can do AI in that sort of representational model of mind way that, that Dreyfus was critiquing. Embodied con cognition, a lot is said about and written about embodied cognition in psychology at the moment and really that's an insight that comes from phenomenology. Merleau-Ponty is often cited. Um, there is another way of, of using the term cognitive science, which is popular at the moment, and this is to designate, rather than all those rich disciplines, um, to designate a cluster of interventions 
derived from or inspired by a particular and contested standpoint within cognitive psychology, which is itself perhaps a subfield of psychology or subdiscipline. Um, I mention that because that's the way that it's quite often used in contemporary education policy, contemporary educational funding. So that's a screen grab from the Education Endowment Foundation, their latest call for social mobility projects. And one of the themes they've got there is cognitive science, by which they mean projects which are interventions based on managing cognitive load, working with schemas, cognitive theory of multimedia learning or approaches related to recall. So obviously I mentioned that because if, you're if you have that broader understanding of cognitive science, then I would consider myself working within and with those disciplines. If you have that much more narrow understanding of what cognitive science is, then I have to admit I'm somewhat outside it um, looking in. Um, just to give you a sense of where some of this is going in the second half. So I've written on memory, I've written on embodied cognition, um, and I employ the literary theor theoretical term carnal hermeneutics in there. Um, I've written on artificial intelligence, knowledge and information, although if you read that paper, my cheating education paper, you'll see that it's not really about artificial intelligence, and I'll say more about that later. I'm making points about contemporary theories of education in there. So the abstract mentions cognitive sciences, it also mentions folk psychology, this has got more or less technical meanings. The more technical meaning in philosophy of mind um, is invoked by, or has been invoked by, um, eliminative materialists who predict that folk psychology will be replaced eventually by neurobiological descriptions of brain states. So there, folk psychology refers to everyday language, a set of cultural assumptions that will eventually be um, eliminated um, because they are materialists. Ultimately, the correct explanations and the accurate explanations will be explanations of brain states. That's the claim. That's kind of a contested point of view. I'm not sure how much currency that has now, but I think there are elements of it in um, some approaches to education, so it's worth thinking about. Less technically, this is used by Strauss, talking about folk psychology and folk pedagogy. Um, it can refer loosely to the ways lay persons represent the psychological world. These lay persons have not studied the cognitive sciences, psychology and related fields that deal directly with the human psyche. So my question is, should the cognitive sciences be allowed to transform the educational language or concepts of teachers? I say should they be because I have no doubt that they can be and in fact there's a whole different talk where I can take you through the, the histories and the mechanisms and the policy and the mimetic transfer and the way certain things have aligned in the contemporary situation which have never aligned before which are acting to quite significantly transform educational language and thought. So I don't doubt that it can happen and that it is happening and a lot of it is being attributed to uh, the input of uh, various understandings of cognitive science. Um, but my question is, is this a desirable process? Is this refining educational thought? Is this professionalising teachers or, or should we be cautious about it? And I'm going to take you through two examples uh, so I'm going to take you through a neurobiological example and then something which is more psychological. And I want to make two points. I want to draw out two reasons for caution. So one of them is that claims for the applicability of cognitive sciences can import their own folk psychology into educational practice. And I'm going to show how that happens. I'm also going to argue that the specialist focus of cognitive sciences can reduce rich educational concepts, which can have a distorting effect on educational practice. So this is from now, I meant to read this to you, so I hope you, yes. So this, consider this claim made by John Geek and Paul Cooper in 2006. John Geek, I think at the time of writing was at Oxford Brooks. He was there a few years before I was there, that's significant later on. As Paul Fletcher from University College London conject conjectured on possible developments arising from the imaging of neural activation, one day there might be enough known about brain activity to show the process of learning and whether it was taking place efficiently. To that end, Geek and Cooper say, we present two possible future scenarios. The scene is a parent-teacher night at a local primary school. 
A parent is discussing the poor maths performance of her child, Chris, with Chris's class teacher. In the first scenario, the teacher acknowledges that Chris's maths performance has been under surveillance for a while. To that end, the teacher has available Chris's event-related neuroimaging report captured in the school's neuroimaging assessment room. Here, the whole class regularly undertakes their term assessment tasks while wearing individual neuroimaging headsets. The class set of individual images is statistically analysed by a dedicated computer and parent-teacher reports generated. After scanning Chris's report, the teacher brings her professional knowledge to bear and recommends a course of real-time biofeedback using mental multi-step arithmetic problems to strengthen Chris's short-term memory circuit for number solutions, which the imaging has shown to be relatively weak. Ongoing neuroimaging assessment during the next month will determine the effectiveness of this individually specific intervention. So the parent is pleased with the professionality of the teacher, especially that the teacher knew what was the matter and could do something about it. The teacher was pleased to be able to act in such a professional manner. Her considerable training, including an MPhil Oxon in education and cognitive neuroscience, had been worth it, especially her research thesis on the neural correlates of learning difficulties in mathematics. In the second contrasting scenario, the teacher is at a loss to explain why Chris might be having maths learning problems. Could it be motivation, the teacher offers? Um, obviously, says the frustrated parent, but that is circular. If Chris had more math success, Chris would be better motivated. I suppose so, replies the teacher. I barely scraped through the lowest level of maths at my school certificate. Well, says the parent, what are you going to do about it? Me, says the teacher. How would I know what to do? After all, I'm only a teacher. I don't know what's causing the problem. Why don't you take Chris for an assessment with Cognitive Services Inc? Here is their card. They'll know what's best to do. Now, note the assumption, firstly, that the real explanation for Chris's difficulties is to be found in the biological structure of the brain. And that the only question for future education is whether the scientists will keep this diagnostic knowledge to themselves or whether the relevant science will bring about this supposed professionalisation of the task of teaching. I'm just going to take you back through some of the things that you've seen. So neuroimaging, just so we're clear, um, there are various ways of measuring brain activity, blood flow to certain regions, electrical activity. So neuroimaging is where you take that data and you, you produce a, a graphical representation of it. Real-time biofeedback. So biofeedback has currency, actually it has currency in, in health, it has currency in sport. Um, the idea being that you can gather information. So you see, you see the person on the running machine, and you're gathering various data, they're hooked up to various things. And you can say, yeah, that thing you're doing, do more of that. Um, we maybe need to modify your diet. We maybe need to go about this in a different way. Um, now, neurofeedback, as it's more commonly caused now, uses those principles. It's really a kind of form of operant conditioning. It hasn't yet been used in any significant way, in any way related to, to the vision that Geek and Cooper have for it. It does get used in sort of educational context. It's been used in there been some interesting studies of real-time neurofeedback or biofeedback in relation to emotion regulation. So the idea is that you can you can gamify the uh, the, 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 the presentation of the data that you're getting from the real-time um, scanning. So you can, for example, you can identify the brain regions which you say correlate with particular emotions, and then you can show the data that's coming from those in, in, in bars going up and down. And the idea is you can look at the you can look at the desirable bar, and you want the desirable bar to go up, and you want the undesirable bar to go down. So as you're trying to um, achieve the desired uh, emotional state, you can kind of look at that feedback, and you can go whatever I, whatever it is I'm doing now, I need to do more of that because I can see that bar going up. And the idea is that that has a sort of educational effect. And there are some um, optimistic hopes for that kind of activity. Um, yeah, I just think it's interesting, this Enfield Oxon in education. OK, you want to you want to make a point about whether teachers are professional or not. But Geek was at Brooks. He was at the other place. You know, why does he have to why does he have to 
validate the other the other location at the time. I just think that's interesting that that, that those those hierarchies make their way into doesn't really help his point. I don't think. Now, um, the point I want to make is not so much that in the intervening years we've got no nowhere near um, identifying anything the neural coroners for anything like the kinds of complex processes or events um, that Deacon Cooper are talking about. Although although we haven't. Um, and I think that's really the, the biggest reason why you notice neurobiology has kind of dropped off um, the list in terms of in terms of educational research um, is because other areas look more promising and promise more immediate results. So cognitive psychology promises more immediate results. Um, Probably the hope for mapping these neurocorrelates will be about using machine learning, pattern recognition. That's what neuroscientists are claiming is going to make this, um, it's going to move on the field. Well, if you're doing that, you might as well use pattern recognition and machine learning more directly in the classroom. You don't actually need to go to reconstructing the brain, getting the processes, and then moving up to a classroom situation. What Google are proposing is that you just use facial recognition and other kinds of data collection methods, and you can get more directly to the kinds of um, prescriptions for future action that you want. So the sort of neurobiological mechanisms are, are, are dropping out of this in educational research. Um, so here you go. Here's one claim I'm going to make. Claims for the capacity of brain imaging technology to inform everyday educational practice are limited in principle. So as I said, it's not only that we've got nowhere near this, it's that I don't think we will get anywhere near this. Um, so why do we think we will? That's the first question. It's a relatively new, although it's widespread, it's relatively a new idea that you would find the answer to um, knotty educational problems or to improving educational practice in the brain. Let's think of, of a few things about this. So the first one is what I call the reductionist issue. So you'll probably be aware you've seen those diagrams. I'm thinking, as I've said diagrams, I could have produced one. That would have helped. Although, although some people interpret dual coding of finding a uh, cognitive psychology later to think that you should probably either talk about the thing or show the diagram but not necessarily do both that's one way of interpreting some of the literature but anyway so you you will have seen the diagrams you've got biology on one layer you've got psychology above that you've got sociology above that and you might say well lots of research is happening in sociology but if we could only just get get down to the ultimate explanation if we could get down to the bottom we'd have the real explanation you know we, eventually we could go below biology we could get to the theory of everything yeah and that's quite an luring thoughts you know there's no more matter as you go up so let's go down get to the get to where the things are happening um, and I, I I think that's a, a misunderstanding of how those layers interact yeah um, yes there's no more matter but what you have got are when you when when on one layer um, entities configure in a sufficiently sort of complex and interesting way. You find that you need to move up to another explanatory layer. We call that emergence. Um, and you find that actually you can't explain things on that layer with reference to a lower layer. That's not to say that the layers don't interact. Um, and that you might, if you want to understand what's going on on that layer, you might sometimes need to go to the lower layer to understand what's going on. But in general, the point of having those different layers of explanation is because um, we've got a real emergent set of relations that can't be explained on that lower level of, of explanation. So on the one hand, you might say learning happens in the brain, let's move down. On the other hand, you might say, where does learning happen? Learning happens in classrooms, learning happens in language, learning happens in the interaction between individuals. Actually, we need to move up, up higher for the relevant explanations here. Um, but this idea that the brain learns persists. Um, much has been written on this by much better scholars than me. So I'll pass over this one quite quickly. Um, but the brain learns is what is uh, sometimes in philosophy called a, a category mistake. Yeah, um, people learn, persons learn. At some point, we started to talk about brains learning analogously. Um, what we probably meant like that is I think I've identified one of one of the explanatory factors that's going on in learning. So when we talk about how the brain learns, we might be saying that um, or we might be saying, um, 
ultimately these processes is like a placeholder and ultimately we'll get that explanation but brains don't learn brains don't remember brains don't think except in a kind of analogous way it's a mistake to say that do people learn people remember people think that's compelling and seductive there's lots of research psychological research into why we are so swayed by brain talk and brain images but largely i think that's a mistake the final allure that I want to talk about is the is the allure of privileged access. Yeah, that, that perhaps brain science can give us access to what's really going on. You might think something's going on. The individual themselves might think something's going on, or they might manifest that something's going on. But if you can get if you can get directly to the brain state, then you'll know what's really going on. Now, engagement is a good example. So I have had colleagues be really excited. You know, engagement is difficult to identify. You know, students can pretend to be engaged, but if everybody had like a little engagement monitoring band, you'd know who was engaged. You could say, oh, they, they might be manifesting all sorts of outward signs, but you'd know. You'd have a you'd have a set of readouts on here, little dials of engagement levels. Now, there's two ways you can take that. One way is you might say that's appealing because hey. There's a whole load of data being gathered there that the teacher just can't gain by scanning the room. Yeah, so actually, this technology is just helping you deal with complexity. And it's doing things that you could achieve by going round, and it's all there. Now, again, as I say, if that's all you're after, then again, you probably don't need to go to brain states. And that's why, as I say, Google and lots of, lots of companies that are promising the effects of AI on education, actually, they just use pattern recognition, facial recognition, um, uh, and, and they, they gather the data on the, on the correspondences between what you can observe um, outwardly and the kinds of behaviours that might, you know, that might assist learning. And you don't need to go to the neurobiological level. On the other hand, I think there's the, there's the idea that um, brain science will, as I say, help us to resolve what engagement really means. And I think that's a problem. Yeah, engagement is a contested term. Lots of educational concepts are contested. They've got normative content. We spend quite a lot of time um, struggling about what they really mean. Um, and I think the idea that you could identify the brain state, or set of brain states that correspond to engagement, is 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 alluring. Um, but of course, what have what have you what have you done there? Um, in order to identify the brain states, you've got to have some relatively unambiguous manifestations of engagement so that you can establish the correlation. Um, so I don't think you're going to resolve that problem. Uh, and I think what's more likely to happen is you say, well, we haven't really resolved what engagement means, but never mind. What we have done is identify a brain state. So let's say that that's what engagement is. Uh, I think that is um, alluring, but eventually will be uh, problematic. Um, I think I've got time yeah i'm going to talk briefly about some further kinds of methodological problems so what i've done here is i've sketched out how a lot of brain-based interventions go in the literature you can argue with me about this we can do this in the questions whether whether they're all like this but what i would say is they start with here's something about the brain yeah it might be sometimes i've seen um paul howard jones's stuff about games um, starts off with, with the behaviour of chimpanzees and, and um, monitoring endorphins. Um, so you, you start off with some, you know, I'm not going to argue, some, some interesting evidentially established brain pr process, maybe it's at the neuronal level. And I'm going to say this inspires an educational intervention. You say because that is going on at the neurobiological level, incidentally, no, no biological level, even once you get to brains, there's a whole set of scales and a whole different set of levels. It's much more complex. I've just simplified it. But you say this is going on at the brain level. And then what you do is you translate up to that sociological, linguistic level. And you say, because we know that right down there, we're going to say that this intervention at the top here in classroom interaction is going to have a desirable result. Um, then you design a pretty standard fair test, randomised control trial, intervention study, whatever you want. Um, and along the way, along the way, you gather data on the relevant brain states. Yeah. Now, one thing you could find is that your intervention brought about 
the desired brain states. And that would be kind of fun. But of course, it wouldn't convince or compel anyone to accept the intervention in an educational context. So you also have to have an independent and relatively recognized way of measuring whether your intervention has had uh, the desired effect. So you go to where else do you go in fair tests? You go to exams, you go to tests, you go to some kind of assessment. Um, now you can see the problem here. The success of the experiment must also be established with reference to some independent criteria, the class test. So although we're claiming a relevant neurobiological mechanism, I'd say the process really is of inspiration. And incidentally, that's a good source for inspiration. A lot of what happens on the EEF um, funded interventions aren't particularly, they're, they're mostly supported by maybe this will work, <laughs> maybe this will work, um, let's do the intervention study. So that's better than nothing, um, but I would say largely in that, in, that, in that process, the brain imaging data become an epiphenomenon. What I mean by that is that they just go alongside, they just go alongside. They don't further strengthen your claim that your intervention is going to be useful in the classroom. Because actually what you did is you translated it into um, classroom applic applicable terminology that could be easily understood by the teacher and you measured it in relation to forms of measurement that you already had available. So you might say, Re really firstly, argue with me, but also you might say, really, why would anyone do that then? Because brain imaging equipment is expensive. Yeah, It's very appealing for neuroeducationists people in education that are excited about the possibilities of neuroscience to get together with neuroscientists and write bids that require very expensive brain imaging equipment. Am I being cynical possibly? Okay, so, so what I'm going to argue there is that actually, I, I, I would say that the biggest, as I say, neurobiology has dropped out of currency, but the, the, the biggest reason for the persistence of claims that you should teach neuroscience in ITE is about the dispelling of neuromyths. There are lots of spurious claims based on spurious neuroscience that need to be dispelled by a better understanding of neuroscience. That's not a great claim for the relevance of your subject for educational practice. We need to teach more neuroscience so we can clear up the mess that's been created by people being really excited about neuroscience. Um, so I'm going to say the biggest neuromyth of all, which will save a lot of time dealing with the other neuromyths, is the claim that brain science is a relevant explanatory layer for everyday classroom practice. The everyday means a lot there. I'm not, I think brain science is absolutely fascinating. I think it's very exciting. What I'm addressing are those claims that it's going to have a significant impact on everyday classroom practice. As I say, it's largely dropped out of currency, but it is a really um, compelling way of making my first point. My first point was that these can import their own folk psychology. So I think here, what's, what's going on here is we get very excited about brains, and so we import the claim that learning happens into the brain, into a classroom situation, which for the most part is better off without it. Um, for the second one, the second one I want to argue, um, and this is about cognitive psychology more broadly in my example, but I'm going to say the specialist focus, and again, I'm not dismissing the important work, but I'm going to say the specialist focus can have the effect of reducing rich educational concepts, and that can then have a distorting effect on educational practice. Now, I'm not saying thereby that we shouldn't do the science. I think I made that point already. And I'm not saying that our educational concepts are always fine. They don't need any interference. Thank you very much. Um, I actually think one of one of the areas where we can, I obviously would say it because it's phenomenology and it's the kind of work I do, but one of the areas where we can do more work is on recovering the things that we already know. You know, what's already at work in our educational concepts that can get neglected. Um, I may not make that point explicitly. I'm just going to kind of hope to have alluded to that point by the end. All right, so this is for everybody involved in ITE. If you don't know those two books and you are involved in ITE at the moment, um, talk to me afterwards um, because, because there you go, you've got Daniel Willingham. So if you're not involved in ITE, you may not even know that um, ITE is subject at the moment to more and a different kind of intervention than it's ever been subject to before from government. So I'm not saying there haven't been any interventions of this sort it directly into the curriculum teacher education but it is an ex in an explicit and wholesale way at the moment that it has never been before so Willingham that book is cited on the core content framework for initial teacher education this is the um, the set of claims or the set of 
um, general principles that every ITE curriculum, including ours, must contain as a basic entitlement. So Willingham is on there. Um, Hirsch is not on there, but Hirsch is in the background to a lot of this. If you read the Ofsted reports, even when they don't directly cite Hirsch, a lot of the ideas are being imported from E.D. Hirsch. So E.D. Hirsch is uh, originally an American literary scholar. Incidentally, they're both colleagues at the University of Virginia or were for a, for a period of time. Um, they buff each other quite a lot. They, 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 they gloss each other. It's not this one, but on the back of William's book is, um, is, a, is, a, is a gloss by Hirsch. Um, and Hirsch became responsible for the for the core knowledge movement in America, which got imported um, by Gove and Gibb. Nick Gibb very proudly says, "I put I put E.D. Hirsch on Gove's desk." This is why it persisted. Gove was gone. Hirsch was still there because and Gibb proudly says, "That was me. It was me all along." <laughs> He's really proud of it. Um, but so so. Hirsch is all over or in the background of the Austin. Hirsch, incidentally, I cannot verify this. I can't prove this in, empirically, um, but I'm pretty convinced of it. Hirsch is the reason why uh, the Ofsted framework for school inspection refers to the need to promote cultural capital in schools. If you look at the way it's then unpacked um, with reference to core knowledge, you can see that what's actually happened there um, is a lapsus calamity, one for the, one for the classicists. It's a, it's a slip of the pen. Someone Someone in an office somewhere, I am absolutely convinced, was involved in all of these discussions around Hirsch's cultural literacy. And by the time it got to Ofsted's framework, someone wrote cultural capital. Trust me, no one at Ofsted is reading Bourdieu. No one at the DfE is reading Bourdieu. Teachers now are all reading Bourdieu and they're holding the Ofsted framework and distinction and they're trying to make them fit, and of course they don't. Um, but, I, but I mention these because although what I'm going to move into is very much the Sweller cognitive psychology, um, Hirsch interacts with this and is in the background of it. Um, and I think it's that close Willingham. Willingham says that Hirsch is the one who said, oh, this cognitive psychology stuff you're doing, you need to come over into, into education. And that book um, has been one of the big popularizers. This is one that has been passed around in the, in the staff rooms. So it's worth talking about. I'm trying to answer the so what questions, right? It's all in here. Um, so again, if you're in ITE, you'll know this diagram. This is the Atkinson Schifrin module of cognitive architecture, which is again, pretty much promoted by the core content framework as being largely um, the be all and end all for teacher education. And I'm not exaggerating there. Um, and all of the other terms that we hear all kind of riff off and are related to this retrieval practice, direct instruction, uh, moving from novice to expert and so on. Um, this is from the Willingham, right? This is what I like to find on the core content framework. Gert Biester is on the core content framework. Please recommend to all your teacher colleagues just to read the Gert Biester paper. But actually, this is on page one of the Willingham, right? Actually, if you read no further in the Willingham, <laughs> you, you'd have a really important insight. I was, I was gratified to see the EEF recently. Um, encouraging ITE providers to say things like um, when talking about the effects of particular interventions based on the evidence base might have this effect could have this effect rather than will have this effect that's quite that's quite nice um, on the other hand the EEF are also believed to have endorsed the core content framework so there's an uneasy relationship there but look what Willingham says on page one when cognitive scientists study the mind they intentionally isolate mental processes in the laboratory in order to make them easier to study but mental processes are not isolated in the classroom they all operate simultaneously and they often interact in difficult to predict ways so although we know that repetition is good for learning for example you couldn't do it all the time because it would be terrible for motivation now if you just encourage your students to hold that in their minds when they're interpreting any of the claims of the core content framework we're in a good place um i often unfortunately many many policy makers, many people at the DfE and HMIs don't necessarily share that attitude. Um, so this is in Sweller based on that um, 
map of the cognitive architecture. We get a particular definition of learning, and I appreciate learning isn't in uh, the quote I've done, but it is, it, is, it is in the context you can see this often as a definition of learning. The major function of instruction is to facilitate the acquisition of domain specific biologically secondary information that is stored in long term memory for later use. OK, so this is a definition which is offered to sharpen, professionalize, improve um, education practice. So this is the paper that it comes from working memory, long term memory and instructional design. Just elaborate on a few things so you get that distinction between biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge. So biologically primary is evolved knowledge because it's evolved over a long historical scale. You don't need to teach it. It's actually looked after developmentally. Um, it actually takes in a broad range of things. It takes in that whole structure. It takes in um, what ways of memorizing, it takes in a lot of what we might consider apparently criticality, creativity are all there actually in the biologically primary evolved and naturally developed. And the problem is you need stuff for all that to work on. So secondary knowledge are, is the achievements of culture, the stuff that won't occur developmentally and needs to be put in uh, that we need to be taught. Um, that distinction is interesting and important because have to make criticisms of the idea of direct instruction, which does valorize certain traditional um, traditional teaching methods like, you know, standing and talking, um, learning by rote, you know, it wants to it wants to address that sort of pejorative sense that learning by rote has got. Um, and one of the easy criticisms is, hey, look, none of this looks very critical or very creative. And you get various responses to that. One of them, which Hirsch himself makes, is, is yeah, do you know what? I'm not bothered. Yeah, because you've got to have the material first. And remember, criticality and creativity are going to look after themselves. You know, you look uncreative and you look uncritical because you've got no um, biologically secondary knowledge to apply that. <laughs> so firstly, you get kind of unapologetically the business of schooling is to input the biologically secondary knowledge and largely let biologically primary knowledge look after itself. That's one response. The other response you'll get is that, hey, people I've taught do well in the GCSEs and GCSEs require criticality. Well, um, I'm happy to engage in a dialogue about that, but you might say the kind of criticality that we might be talking about here might be selecting from a set, selecting what is relevant to the particular situation from a previously defined set of material. So you might say that's not getting us towards some ideas of, of criticality. But the, the biggest reason why um, Sweller and others don't say very much about biological and primary knowledge is they say because we know very little about it. <laughs> we know very little about it, but it doesn't matter because evolution has looked after that, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, then you get this novice expert distinction where the idea is, um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the work has been done on chess experts, various different kinds of expertise, but chess, chess was a primary one. Um, an expert is someone who has an enormous store of domain specific biologically second, secondary information concerning his or her area of expertise held in long term memory. And that is the amount of biologically secondary information which makes the big difference. It's not about the capacities for criticality. It can overcome all kinds of differences in size of working memory. Um, so it's all about how much you've got in your long term memory. It's worth pointing out now that a lot of this is based on um, maths. Lots of the work has been done in maths, much less of the work has been done in, for example, English. Actually, though, that's not to say it hasn't been done in humanities. A lot of the pioneering work in this was done in history. I find out from colleagues quite recently. Um, I'm going to make some points about how things that might work in maths don't work in English, but I'm not really just arguing about the transferability between disciplines. A lot of the things I want to, I want to say about it's not working in English, you can transfer back. You can transport back onto the mass. I think that's quite important. But you can see how this kind of a one, you know, uh, with that problem, the best move is to multiply out the denominator. Um, that provides an example of the main specific skill that applies only to a limited class of algebra problems. Fine. But a lot of other things that you might want to teach aren't really like that. And a lot of the, pro the teaching activities are based on breaking down this process, 
um, using uh, worked examples, gradually removing extra bits, you know, so removing the scaffolding so that you can finally do it independently. Um, and as I say, then I, th I think largely the reason why a lot of the research has been done in maths rather than other areas is you can see how you would break down the stages there. But what are the stages that you would break down for understanding Julius Caesar, for example? I mentioned Julius Caesar because this is from page nine of Hirsch's Cultural Literacy. I will read it to you. Uh, my father used to write business letters that alluded to, sh to Shakespeare. These allusions were effective for conveying complex messages to his associates because in his day, business people could make such allusions with every expectation of being understood. For instance, in my father's commodity business, the timing of sales and purchases was all important and he would sometimes write or say to his colleagues, there is a tide, without further elaboration. Those four words carried not only a lot of complex information, but also the persuasive force of a proverb. In addition to the basic practical meaning, act now, what came across was a lot of implicit reasons why immediate action was important. He goes on to say how concise that was. Him just saying it in four words, unlocked all of these associations that you would have needed a lot of other words to make the point through. Now, I mean, the first thing is, I kind of think of the way my my um, my children communicate quite a lot of the time, is that you don't need Shakespeare for that kind of concision. Yeah, we've got memes now. Memes can do a lot of the job. I, you know, I wasn't imaginative enough to find the meme that would do the job, but I can imagine that there is one. Uh, and that there are in fact many. So that's one thing, that's one problem here. Why does it need to be Shakespeare? Aren't, aren't there other cultural forms that we can now interact with and that we can in fact assume a lot of people to know? That's the first thing. But the second thing is, what is he really after here? Okay, in, in cultural literacy, there's an appendix of the 5,000 key bits of knowledge which he designed with his friends. You know, he says a hundred independent people have all kind of agreed with me. They're just your chumps. But the 5,000 bits of knowledge that you need to be a literate American. Yeah. Obviously, there is a tide is on the list. Lots of other Shakespeare quotes are on the list, scientific concepts and so on. It's amazing, actually. I'm just going to pick some at random. Um, so here we go. Vatican II, Vector, VE Day, Velocity, Venereal Disease, Venezuela, Venial Sin, Veni Vidi Vici, Veni Weedy Weechi, I should say, Venice, Ventricle, Venus, brackets, Aphrodite, and so on. Yeah. Now, is he, what's he after, right? Is he saying that they knew this because they were directly instructed in the 5,000 key bits of knowledge, or is he suggesting that what we're doing is some kind of replacement for some kind of literary engagement with Shakespeare that they had? Incidentally, towards the end of the book, Hirsch says, you don't even have to have read the stuff. Yeah? The important thing is to identify what's in our storehouse of ideas. You have to read the whole of Julius Caesar. Right? It's an interesting, um, Eli, you were recently lamenting, weren't you? You're reading Romeo and Juliet, but you've got to read it on your own. You're not being taught the whole of the book, you've just been taught particular bits. So what's he after? Is he after, are, are the 5,000 words, are they just, a, are they the 5,000 key nodes onto which other, other bits of literate knowledge are going to be grafted, or are they going to do the job? And actually there's, 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 there's reasons for thinking he's not being particularly ambitious here. There's reasons for thinking actually all he wants here is to bring, he says, oh, I just want to bring the illiterate one third up to the level of the literate two thirds. So all I do really want here is to give them the things that they should know. I'm not even going to get involved in all of the issues with that should, of course. There are many issues. But I think it's worth thinking, what, what, what does he have in mind? That, the, that this will be, that this will lead to further fruitful interactions with literature or that simply being taught there is a tide having the quote explained to you is going to do the job. Um, which one he's after really matters, I think, and it matters for how applicable um, the cognitive psychology, which Hirsch himself invokes to support his perspective, um, actually is in the classroom. So I'm going to say that I think Hirsch himself, as well as the cognitive psychologist, forgets, and Hirsch should know better, a lot of his background is in hermeneutics, um, although he's often held up, incidentally, when you're studying hermeneutics as an, as an example of the wrong perspective in philosophical hermeneutics. It's a very kind of conservative hermeneutics in which there is a correct understanding of a literary text. In fact, he wants to put 
literary interpretation on the level of a science, which a few other people have got a problem with, as you can imagine. But I think he forgets three important properties of knowledge. And all I want to do in the rest of this is just take you through some areas of my work where I've tried to um, recognise those important properties. So it is always di acquired dialogically against the background. And you might say, well, this is the point of the difference between novices and experts. But I'm going to say, actually, it's more problematic than that. There are no clear novices and experts, for example, in relation to literary understanding. It has a history. It's not substrate independent. So there's an idea about data. You know, there's, that, there's that dream, the transhumanist dream that we will eventually upload our minds um, into the cloud. Um, and that, that data doesn't matter what physical form you move it from to what substrate you move it across is the same data. So I would say knowledge doesn't work like that. It has a history. It is not substrate independent. How it is instantiated matters and how it came to be accumulated and sedimented matters. And I would say it's not encoded as data. Neurobiology is amazing, right? You know, you just when you, when you just think about it, it's brilliant. But when you think about it, you know, there is no data there. There is no data there. There's just squishy, fleshy, avocado, greasy stuff, yeah? Um, it's not encoded as data, it is embodied, uh, and that is... So this is from one of my papers, Three Epiphanic Fragments, from much earlier in my career. I'm going to read it out to you. I'm occasionally saddened when I realise that no particular moment of intimacy I share, this was 2013, 14, I share with my infant son, so I think it was you, Joan, I was thinking of, will be remembered in his adult life, and yet, these moments will be preserved in our relationship in that they will form the continuous background of our future interactions. Any judgments I've been able to make about my own father's affection for me were based on an interpretation of contemporary events that only showed up against just such a background in my own being. Referring to Merleau Ponty, Van Gogh's paintings have their place in me for all time. A step is taken from which I cannot retreat. And even though I retain no clear recollection of the pictures which I've seen, my whole subsequent aesthetic experience will be that of someone who has become acquainted with the painting of Van Gogh. Um, now I think one of the things about phenomenology, as you can say quite a lot in a very short space of time, but I think one of the things I'm pointing towards there is I'm problematizing, at least with reference to aesthetics and literary interpretation, the idea that you've got novices and experts. There is no point at which you can furnish a background for literary inter interpretation and assume that no background already exists. You're always going to be attaching whatever it is you want students to appreciate to the threads which are already there uh, in their backgrounds. That's one first insight. This is from my knowledge insertion paper, a little bit of um, science fiction speculation. Um, I'm referring here to Jeff Ryman's book, The Child Garden. Fascinating book, science fiction. Envisages a world where at a certain age, everybody is given a virus which makes the required, it does their education, it makes the required, it changes the shape of their brain so that they know uh, the information that they need to know. Now, the important thing about that is obviously you only do that from the people that, have all, that already know things. Yeah, you, so you've got that knowledge. So what you're actually doing is you're changing the brain shape so that the brain shape better resembles someone who knows the stuff that you want to know. And that has certain implications in the book uh, that I think are important here. So we can't separate the state of being a knower from the history whereby that knowing was achieved. We could not arrive at the knowledge, that is, without becoming the person who knows. Incidentally, this is a paper where I'm considering a thesis uh, that a colleague presents, which is that you could somehow insert the knowledge by changing the, you know, changing the brain is the re required state and, and bypass education. That's why it was cheating education. Jeff Ryman shows us when his virus engineered protagonist takes refuge in what her genes, that's what they refer to the process as, can tell her about reading Das Kapital. So for a reason, she has to hide down in her mind as she does this by hiding in knowledge of Das Kapital. She realizes that all implanted knowledge is someone's knowledge hard one by them before it could be inserted in others. As she delves deep into the reading of marks that she's inherited, she begins to lose herself in the personality of Heather. Her growing knowledge of the text becomes inseparable from Heather's desires, dispositions, purposes and dreams, which intermingle with her own and disorient her. There is no halfway house of knowing between simply being able to see or recall the text of Marx and being the person who read it. 
Um, and Ryman reminds us here that there's a relation, therefore, between inserting propositional knowledge and transforming attitudes. So when Milena looks at other people who've gone through this process that for various reasons she wasn't able to go through, um, she sees that having knowledge inserted is at the same time to reach a uniformity of opinion and behaviour on ethical and social matters. At the end of the insertion process, people believed the same things. One more example from my Love Triangle paper. I really enjoyed that title. To acknowledge that texts have a texture is to acknowledge that they affect or feel to the one who understands in a particular way. Texts have a grain which can, of course, be read against. What we read can give us goosebumps, make our hackles rise, our flesh crawl or our hairs stand up. What is read or encountered as an object of learning can inspire, frustrate, hearten, sadden, repulse or even bore stiff. OK, now, why do I say that? Um, it's because I think what Hirsch is really playing, mean, if he really is just saying, here's the 5,000 things you need to know, go away and teach them. Fair enough. But I think he's implying that at some point, because you've given this background, you will be able to say, go now, read, build on this stock, add other things, interact. Those things that we just did with Julius Caesar, go and do them with a whole range of other things and thus build your cultural awareness. And I think to, if you're going to do that, you need to take, take uh, pay attention to certain particularities in the individual student, particularities about background, particularities of their history, um, and particularities around <coughs> embodiment. So, final slide, you'll be pleased to know. In my knowledge insertion paper, I suggested a, a Turing test, which was part of the reason why it was, it was John Tilson, um, colleague at Liverpool Hope University, why his, his model, it's obviously a science fiction scenario, but why his model wouldn't work. Um, for why you couldn't just insert the knowledge. And the Turing test was basically just conversation. As you know, Alan Turing, Benedict Cumberbatch plays him in the movie. Um, this is how he says, you, you, this is your test for artificial intelligence. You'll know you've achieved general artificial intelligence if um, the artificial intelligence can, can convince an interlocutor that they are having a conversation with a real person. So I would say your Turing test for knowing is whether your supposed knower can convince an interlocutor that they actually know. Uh, and where I think this will fall down is when you ask questions like, why did you read that? Why did you read that and not something else? What was your favourite bit? What do you most like about it? What have you liked more? What have you liked less? What effect did it have on you? Um, and I think the idea of that Turing test can get us to an interesting situation. I'm just going to leave you with this as a thought. I'm not going to elaborate on it. But I think that Turing test, which is nothing more than conversation, maybe with somebody else who enjoyed Julius Caesar or who read the quotation in context, that Turing test could enable an interlocutor, interlocutor to say, you don't know that, you just learnt it in school. Uh, I'm going to stop there.